Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be the moderator today for the fourth session of the European Climate and Health Responder Course. This session uh, four will be about water supply and sanitation, and this uh, this uh, course is uh, co-organized by the Association of School of Public Health in the European Region and the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. So today it's the fourth uh, session on the, over the total of 10 sessions uh, that will close at the end, uh, at the beginning of April, uh, before a uh, final uh, examination. So today, uh, the session learning objectives will be uh, four different objectives. First of all, to explore the links that exist between climate change and water, as in water as a determinant of health of the population. The second one is to understand the link between the main drivers of climate and climate change and its main impact on source and drinking water quality. Then to discuss the adaptation actions uh, possible to increase the resilience of uh, society and water systems. And then to understand how the climate change could impede the achievement of the, the, <clears throat> the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So to continue, uh, I will give you uh, some uh, classical information about the logistics of this session. So uh, it's basically uh, a 19 minute session that will be divided within uh, one lecture of 45 minutes and uh, two case studies of uh, 10 minutes each. <clears throat> So we will make a question and answer section at the end of the lecture and the end of the two case studies. And uh, please uh, put your question in the Q&A panel, not in the chat. So in the Q&A panel for the different question. Um, for the question, yeah, that could not be uh, answered. Uh, we can be ask the presenter to respond to all this question offline uh, and upload the document uh, with the slide of uh, you know on the on the website. So I remember so to keep the microphone on mute and the camera off during the presentation, and to be uh, respectful to the other uh, within the chat. So this session will be recorded and will be posted on the website within the four, 24 hours after the session and all the reference materials and slide decks will be included on the website. Also for the participants, we gave a, a certificate of participation if uh, they attend more than 70% of the live session and pass the final exam with a score of 70% at the end of the course. The certificate of participation in climate and health will be rewarded from the House Fair and GCCHA, the co-organizer of this course. The participant must also join each, each class session using their personal and unique Zoom links and complete the final exams with their email address used to initially register during the course. We uh, also remind that the attendance will be automatically recorded during the live Zoom sessions. And then uh, finally, at the end of this, uh, of, uh, of this course, the exam link will be sent on the final day of class via email and will remain open for 48 hours. And we will award the certificates uh, one week after the last, uh, the last session on April 16, 2024. So today we have three different presenters, um, Professor Jan Semenza, uh, we will give the, the lecture, and Professor Analova Carducci and Dr. Marija Jeftic will give the two case studies. <clears throat> so uh, I want uh, to begin by thanking you to participate to this uh, session and to remind you that we have a post-session survey, uh, the access uh, could be uh, via this uh, QR code that is on the on the screen that you can scan with your phone camera, or uh, you can link also uh, click on the link in the chat or go on the website to access this post session survey. So. To begin uh, the first lecture, uh, I will introduce uh, Dr. Jan Semenza. So good morning, Jan Semenza. Jan Semenza is an environmental epidemiologist with 30 years of experience in climate change and health. 
He led the US CDC response to the 1995 heat wave in Chicago and elucidated the underlying causes of heat related mortality. These insights uh, helped to define policy intervention and help heat action plans in the US designed to prevent these climate change impacts. He led also the work on infectious disease and climate change at the European CDC and investigated climatic and environmental determinants of water, food, and vector-borne disease. He devised a tool that has been operationalized at the CDC to monitor sea surface temperature and salinity in marine environments to assess the suitability of viral infection or potentially fatal disease. He is also lead author of the <clears throat> Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change RR6 report. He wrote the infectious disease section and developed indicators for climate change and health that are tracked as part of the global Lancet countdown. Currently, is associated with the Department of Sustainable Health at the University of Sweden and Heidelberg Institute of Global Health in Germany. So, Professor Semenza, uh, I let you for the lecture for 45 minutes. Thank you, Yanis. So, thanks so much for inviting me to speak here today. It's an honor to be part of this uh, responder course, which is a great resource for the public health community. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, thanks uh, for again for inviting me to speak here. And I will be touching on water supply and sanitation today uh, as a topic that's uh, of huge public health importance. And these were the learning lessons, learning objectives that Yanis uh, um, highlighted already. So I skipped that, that first slide right away. And basically the outline of my talk is illustrated here. And you'll see that there are two parts to my uh, talk today. I'll be talking about climate change impacts. And in order to do that, I need to address the hydrologic uh, cycle and then these pathways of waterborne diseases. I will address hazard, vulnerability, and exposure, which is the IPC framework for thinking about the risk. And then I'll touch on cascading risk pathways that are caused by heavy rain, drought, and extreme temperature. And then in the second part of my talk, I will be speaking about climate change adaptation, what can we do when it comes to surveillance and monitoring? How do we build early warning systems? I will touch on the 10 essential public health functions, water safety plans, and sanitation safety plans. And the first part now is here illustrated with climate change impact. So that's the first uh, part of my talk. And then I'll talk about adaptation in the second part of my talk. And so just to give you a quick overview, on this slide here, you can see how climate change manifests itself with a lot of different types of exposures. And we have uh, addressed that the extreme heat uh, as a, a dedicated session just a couple of weeks ago. We have spoken about air pollution last week. And then today I will uh, touch on water contamination um, um, due to uh, these climate impacts and how that also impacts water quantity. And you can see that these exposures are modulated by human, social, financial, physical, and natural capital in society that then has uh, translates in these health uh, risks for, for individuals. And that can you know, lead to all kinds of, of health endpoints, obviously, that are listed. Some of them are listed here. But the important thing that I would like to stress is that we have experienced a 1.15 degrees Celsius increase in ambient temperature due to climate change since the pre-industrial time. So the temperature has increased now worldwide by 1.15 degrees Celsius. But guess what? That ambient temperature is just a minimal manifestation of what's actually going on because it turns out that the oceans the water, the, ocean, the global oceans, they absorb 90% of that heat. So the majority of that heat is in fact absorbed in the oceans. And that again manifests itself during in, 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 in marine heat waves. And in fact, uh, this slide here is for June, 2023, but it turns out that May, June, July, August, these are all extreme heat wave months, that marine heat wave months that exceeded historic precedent. So we are into something else that we have never experienced before where the oceans are, are heating up faster than, than anticipated. What does that mean? It turns out that the, the heating of the ocean 
um, uh, obviously leads to more evaporation, which you can see here at the bottom part of the slide. And so there is more air that evaporates and then obviously the water condenses into clouds. And then we obviously have precipitation and the climate change will lead to more extreme precipitation events that then leads to runoff and infiltration of uh, of this rain into the um, into the aquifer and so this is the hydrological cycle that manifests itself now with these climate extremes like extreme precipitation events and what does that mean to public health and that's what i would like to illustrate today and um, we all know that the drivers of climate change are in fact the fossil fuels. And I would like to point out that here is your tax money at work because we heavily subsidize fossil fuels. We as a society, your tax money at work uh, subsidizes the fossil fuel industry to create more and more of these greenhouse gas emissions um, um, from the fossil fuel industry. But obviously de deforestation, agriculture with the cows and methane and methane emissions and land use. Those, these are all climate change drivers that have um, an impact on our climate with increased ambient temperature, extreme precipitation and floods, increased droughts and sea level rise. And it turns out that these climate hazards impact the, the pathway of, of waterborne diseases by mobilizing and dispersing these pathogens, by increasing the replication and survival of these pathogens. You can see here on the right top corner how one organism multiplies, becomes two, and then they double into four. And so how the temperature increases that replication rate of, of these pathogens is a huge issue. But it also increases the, the dispersion, so flood water and, and sewer gets contaminated, and that increases our exposure in, in, in public health. And that in turn leads to an increased disease burden, illustrated at the very bottom part of the, this diagram. And so in this particular table here that you can look up with the reference listed below, you can see how, for example, temperature has differential impacts depending on what kind of pathogens we are, are looking at. For example, you can see here the Vibrio cholera in temperature increases the survival and growth of, of, of these um, organisms, whereas other organisms like rotavirus, norovirus, or cryptosporium, temperature actually decreases um, the replication rate uh, of these pathogens and increases the die-off rate. So these are differential impacts, how temperature differentially impacts different types of organism. It's, it's um, 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 not just that we see an increase in survival, but also the decrease in survival. Then we, when we speak about flooding, as an example, had leptospirosis, which leads to increase uh, pathogen mobilization in, in, in society. I turn my camera off to increase the bandwidth. But um, we can also see that um, 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 drought um, will have an, an increase, will decrease hand hygiene, which increases the exposure to pathogens again, and then sea level rise uh, will contaminate potentially our drinking water supply. So this list here illustrates the impact of of these climate hazards on different types of pathogens and what does mean for, for public health. When we think about risk from climate change, we need to consider the IPCC framework for risk, which takes into account hazard. And in this case, we are speaking about an increase in temperature, extreme rain events or heat waves. And that uh, um, needs to be taken into account when we think about vulnerability. For example, in society, cer certain individuals have are at increased risk due to their pre-existing medical condition, demographic characteristics, but also societal vulnerabilities that put them at in increased risk. And then we need to take into account the exposure of these individuals. What is the geography like? The wash system, water and hygiene system, sanitation hygiene system. If we have a dilapidated sanitation system, then these people will be at more risk for exposure. And those those three aspects of risk illustrated at the heart here of the Venn diagram, the hazard, vulnerability, and exposure, these are the ones that determine the risk from climate change.
Unfortunately, when it comes to waterborne diseases, the issue is even more complicated because imagine a situation like this, where you have an extreme rain event, and that rain event disproportionately impacts those houses that are built in the floodplain, for example. So these houses now are, are at, at increased risk because they are built in the floodplains where they can be flooded. And in fact, that will lead to new exposures because it turns out that once that house is flooded, it turns out that rats come out of the woodworks and they might contaminate the water with Leptospira, or it could be that the water is contaminated with fecal coliform, or you have standing water and mosquitoes propagate in the standing water. And all these things put people at risk that are, again, vulnerable. They could be vulnerable because they don't have screens on their windows. They could be vulnerable because they are they have pre-existing medical conditions. And that, that potentially puts them at risk for exposure to flood water that's contaminated with fecal coliform, for example. So the point I'm trying to make is that there is a, a cascading risk that we need to take into account depending on societal vulnerabilities. So it is important to consider the risk not just about hazard vulnerability and exposure, but also the cascading pathways that can lead to uh, um, increased risk to certain populations. So whether such a heavy rain event can potentially trigger, trigger a sequence of secondary events um, that uh, where one event uh, uh, triggers the next, and those are called cascading risk pathways of causally connected events that can potentially result in large scale waterborne outbreaks. For example, there are certain pathways that are caused by increased temperature, other pathways by drought, by increasing temperature or by sea level rise. And in this paper here, I illustrate some of these examples. And I would like to walk you through some of the scenarios of where, what, we, what can we expect from these cascading risk pathways in relationship to these type of climate hazards. For example, heavy rain leads to storm runoff mobilizes the transport pathogens, and then that results in waterborne outbreak. For example, here's a diagram of um, metropolitan area. You have um, uh, a rain event at the top left corner that can potentially flush these pathogens from wildlife into uh, streams, and then it contaminates the water supply uh, uh, below there, and then can potentially enter the water distribution system and lead to waterborne outbreaks. The problem is that a lot of um, um, cities or metropolitan areas have combined sewers. And what that means is that the sewer from, an, from a house is um, connected to the sewer system, obviously, but also the, the, the catch basin of uh, effluents uh, from, from rain, like a rain catch basin, also connects to the sewer, which then co leads to combined sewer outfall, where contaminated water enters the drinking water supply potentially and contaminates um, um, that, that water source. And we examined that, that situation epidemiologically in the northern part of, of Europe. And here you see Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark. And these blue dots correspond to waterborne outbreaks and um, the size of the bubble corresponds to the number of cases that were, uh, are observed in these waterborne outbreaks. And so we analyzed all these waterborne outbreaks in a case control study where we assessed the meteorologic conditions prior to that waterborne outbreak. And we were particularly interested in those waterborne outbreaks that were preceded by an extreme precipitation event in the 95th percentile for that location. And so we looked at these extreme precipitation events in relationship to these outbreaks. And we did, in fact, see a threefold increased risk of a waterborne outbreak if, in fact, it was preceded by um, um, a waterborne uh, a, 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 a rain event that was in the 95th uh, percentile. A, a, a case in point will be a cryptosporidium, which has these very sturdy little oocytes illustrated on this CDC diagram right here uh, in the center. You can see this thick walled oocytes. So cryptosporidium is a parasite that comes uh, in a very uh, um, 
uh, sturdy form, this oocyte that can survive chlorination. And so during heavy rainfall, precryptosporidium parasites can potentially wash into the waterways where it can contaminate water treatment plants. And a, 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 an extremely famous example is the situation in Milwaukee in 1993, where um, uh, the, there is water treatment failure and cryptosporidium oocytes enter the water treatment plant, which resulted in the largest outbreak break of cryptosporidium in, in the US. And so this is the scenario. So here you can see the blue um, heavy precipitation up event at the very top left corner. And then the par parasites illustrated in orange here enter the waters, the, the streams, and then the water intake of the water treatment plant. And you can see that it even enters the water distribution system where it then can contaminate the uh, drinking water supply and which leads to a big um, outbreak in, in the metropolitan area. And we examined that looking at European data. This is data from, from Northwest uh, England. And these peaks here uh, correspond to cryptosporidium cases in two different authorities, an authority with spring peaks and one without. And it turns out that in 2000, new water regulations were implemented in Northwest England, in those um, health authorities where they, they saw these uh, spring outbreaks. And because they, they in implemented filtration and UV irradiation of the water, they were able to eliminate these spring peaks that were obviously associated with extreme rain events that contaminated the water distribution system that led to these cryptosporidium outbreaks. So the good news here is that we can, in fact, intervene with public health measures and fix the water treatment system with more advanced uh, technologies to eliminate these type of sturdy oocytes that are resistant to chlorine, but not to UV light or filtration. Another example is Leptospira, a bacteria that's um, spread by, by rodents. Leptospira uh, spread through urine of infected animals. And in fact, the Leptospira can in fact survive for months in water or, or soil that's contaminated. And um, often if you have inadequate uh, infrastructure where people live in close proximity to animals, we, people can get exposed to leptospira transmitted by rats. And this is particularly the case when floodwaters um, after heavy rain are contaminated with uh, these bacteria. And th this is particularly the case in urban centers in Brazil and the South, South Pacific Islands. And here again, so a similar kind of a, a diagram. Again, in blue, you can see the heavy rain and in orange, the, the Leptospira uh, um, um, bacteria. And you can see how on the left, the infected urine from rats now um, leads to the bacteria to spread into the, the open sewer and contaminated sewer where the, they then spread and disperse in the floodwaters where we then experience the outbreak of, of Leptospira. And in fact, here is some data from a work that have been done by Albert Cohen. You can see the increase in number of cases of Leptospira in, in relationship to, to cumulative rainfall. So it's obviously um, a relationship that, that holds true, statistically speaking. But in fact, this is not just an issue in the global south. It turns out that also here in, uh, in, in the global north, where in Copenhagen, there was a torrential downpour in 2011 that in fact flooded many hospitals and also the WHO headquarters for the European region, the Euro office, was flooded during this extreme event. And then after they were trying to clean up the, 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 after the floodwaters had receded, they, they, they put 250 people to work to clean up these, um, uh, the, um, the, these uh, flooding issues. And it turns out that one individual contracted leptospirosis and died, and another person got infected as well. So this is in a, a serious issue that even affects the, 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 the global north during these extreme precipitation events. Another scenario that we need to consider is a heavy rain that leads to floods, which then potentially damages the water supply that leads to outbreaks. And that's illustrated at the bottom corner here or the bigger plant that's flooded um, as well. And in fact, that's exactly what we documented epidemiologically, again, with our case control study, where we saw an almost ninefold increased risk for 
a single household water supplies if they were preceded by an extreme precipitation event prior to, to that event by one week. It turns out that heat is also a potential driver of these cascading risk pathways. And in this case, the vulnerability is a deficient uh, water uh, sanitation and hygiene system. Uh, the, the, the wash system infrastructure is deficient and that contaminates the water source that can potentially lead to water, uh, uh, cholera outbreaks. And in fact, cholera um, is um, a pathogen that can potentially contaminate the water supply after a heavy precipitation event. And that is an issue for if the latrines um, stand in um, areas with a high water table where it can get in touch with, with uh, surface water. It turns out we have something like almost 3 million cases of cholera uh, year um, annually with something like 20, uh, 95,000 case uh, deaths as, as well. And that's, as I mentioned, due to inadequate sanitation and hygiene and people that lack uh, access to, to care because you can obviously intervene with cholera with vig vigorous rehydration. But so this is an example of a latrine that stands in in uh, um, an area with high with a high water table, and you can see how it gets in touch with surface water. And this one here is a graph that illustrates the relationship between the quantity of precipitation and the number of um, cholera um, uh, cases uh, that follow suit after a couple of months. And you, this is from Lusaka in Zambia in two thousand and four. Unfortunately, I'm um, um, sad to report that this is not a an issue of the past, because in fact, this was here from 2004, but 2024, two decades later, I just pulled this off the New York Times a couple of days ago, you can see here that we have something like 4,000 uh, people that have died um, in um, in the southern part of, of Africa, and the, the, the image here, the photograph is um, again, Lusaka, where pac patients are being treated for cholera um, in, in, in the capital of Zambia um, two decades later after that, that slide I showed you earlier. Uh, and again, so they pin it here on poor water and sewer system, which is what I mentioned uh, earlier. So the thing to important the thing the important thing to record to remember with cholera is the fact that there are two different forms. There's an endemic form which occurs with a background rate in the population with distinct peaks, and then an endemic form which is um, um, leads to these massive outbreaks in unexposed populations. And um, often we need to consider the convergence of extreme precipitation at high temperature. And um, also the combination of deficient wash infrastructure that increases the vulnerability for those patients, pay, uh, the, these individuals for, for a large uh, uh, scale cholera outbreaks. And here again is a diagram. In this case, we have the blue for precipitation, but the pink for the warming, the increase in temperature. And then here, the purple on the left, you can see the storm surge sea level rise. So there are three climate hazards on this particular slide here. And in orange, again, we have the, the, the Vibrio bacteria that's now dispersed from, from houses in the outbreak area but also due to the, the flooding of the, the latrines that leads to dispersion, and that in turn leads to contamination and dispersion of the, the bacteria and these outbreaks uh, in this community here. Another scenario is drought, and it turns out that drought can lead to intermittent drinking water supply because they need to uh, preserve the, their water source, and so they turn off the tap for certain days, certain hours of the day. And in fact, that can lead to cross connections with sewer lines. And I illustrate in a second what I mean by that. And that in turn leads to, to outbreak. And I, a study I did in Central Asia, this one here is Uzbekistan. And I did a study here in Nukuz, which is south of the Aral Sea. I don't know if you have, uh, are familiar with the Aral Sea, but it's probably one of the biggest ecologic disasters of our time, where all the water for the Aral Sea has been used for cotton production during Soviet times. And and uh, no water reached the Aral Sea, so it, it hardly exists anymore, uh, uh, despite the fact that it was a, a vibrant biotope at 
the time. And when we went to Nukus, we observed these summer peaks of dysentery and diarrhea, and we were kind of puzzled. Why do we see these summer peaks of, of, of diarrhea? So we went to the water treatment plant in Nukus, and we saw that it was fully operational. And in fact, on the right, you can see these chlorine canisters that, that chlorinate and disinfect the the, the water source for, for the city of Nukus. So we are kind of puzzled and we so we asked our question, how can we potentially document that the water supply is at fault here that leads to these weak, these summer outbreaks of, of dysentery and, and diarrhea? And so what we decided to do, we decided to set up um, a randomized intervention trial with home chlorination. So we provided these kind of canisters for people where they were able to disinfect the water with chlorine that we were able to get off the, from the market. And in this container here, they were now able to disinfect the water and they were not uh, able to recontaminate the water because it was a closed container. And so if you look at the two bottom graphs here, lines of this graph, you can see that the, the squares correspond to the home chlorination, and then the round uh, dots correspond to homes with piped water. So it turns out that those individuals with home chlorination has a lower diarrheal rate, illustrated on the y-axis here, than people with access to piped water. So if you have piped water, you have more diarrhea than people with access to home chlorination. What does that mean? We examined the the, the water source, and we basically came to the conclusion after our assessment that the the the, the water lines were cross connected were were contaminated with sewer. So if you think about a water drinking line that is not pressurized, and particularly if that water line is at a slant, that creates a vacuum in the water line that sucks in sewer from the uh, from the environment if that sewer line um, um, is connected through the water table with the drinking water line and you can co cross contam contaminate the drinking water with sewer that's uh, next door so if we would like to adapt to these kind of 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 uh, climatic extremes or climate hazards, we need to consider to constantly pressurize the drinking water line to avoid a vacuum, uh, uh, to, to avoid to create a vacuum in the drinking water line that could potentially suck in pathogens from the environment. And then the water line has to be physically built above the sewer line so you have a unidirectional flow away from the drinking water line and so to avoid this kind of, 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 of contamination. And so this is now climate change adaptation. And so this is my segue to the next part of the second part of my talk. And this is now climate change adaptation. And here I would like to illustrate a, a few uh, concepts. Again, we have the hazard vulnerability and exposure that I mentioned earlier that determine the impact or the risk for waterborne diseases. And we would like to see how we potentially decrease that, that, that risk by, uh, by focusing on the hazard vulnerability and exposure to minimize these population impacts. And in this table here, in the same paper that I mentioned earlier, we list a number of adaptation options. And if, what, what we can do for surveillance and monitoring, for example, is to set up systems where we monitor meteorologic conditions, such as rainfall, fall, and temperature. Or we can set up systems that monitor environmental conditions, such as salinity, sea surface salinity in ocean water, or microbial agents, where we detect, where, where we monitor bacteria, virus, or parasites in, in the water supply. And um, obviously, we can also improve our healthcare system as a strategy to, in, to uh, improve our response to these kind of threats. And the thing we want to consider here are the 10 uh, um, components of the WHO operational framework to improve the healthcare system or the 10 essential public health functions. And here are the 10 essential uh, public health functions. So we are uh, talking about surveillance, outbreak investigations. We need to inform communities, educate communities, and empower them. We need to build partnerships with a number of stakeholders in society to bring them to the table. We need to develop policies and regulations 
to minimize potential adverse impacts on public health. We need to enforce those rules and laws. We need to link people to care, make sure that we have universal health care where everybody has access to the appropriate care. We need to train our workforce. And in fact, this is what this workshop, this, this session is all about today. And then we would like to evaluate our programs and, and, and drive advancements through research. And so these are the 10 essential public health uh, functions that are elaborated more in the paper listed below. If you want to know the different components of that, um, what needs to be done specifically for infectious diseases, here you have an, as the outline for those 10 essential public health functions. On the next slide now, I have the operational framework for WHO, how to build climate resilient health system. And you can see how we focus here on leadership and governance and healthy workforce and um, uh, financing and all these different aspects that are required for to build an operational framework for health systems. And then continuing on our table here for diagnostics, obviously we need to uh, improve uh, um, um, diagnostics, but also access to safe water. And that's what we do uh, through uh, water safety plans. We need to improve uh, safe sanitation, and that's what we do through sanitation safety plans. And um, these plans illustrated on the slide here, for example, these are water safety plans. And you can see in the center of the slide here how the water treatment plant is currently flooded. Obviously, that's something that doesn't really uh, fulfill its public health function. And in fact, that's something that I illustrated on the cartoon earlier. And so this water safety plan um, basically walks you through how you build a team um, that of individuals, of civil engineers and public health professionals and microbiologists and all the, these individuals who are going to have part of the team. And then how you set up a vulnerability assessment of your water system and how you set up an adaptation assessment of how you can potentially assess the risks and then minimize those risks from, from, from climate hazards. And so this, this particular document from WHO that go, walks you through the different steps, how to build climate resilient water safety plans. And on the next slide, I have the sanitation plans. This is a step-by-step -step, uh, approach how to um, improve more uh, uh, um, just, equitable, and, and safe sanitation systems that improve hygiene in populations um, overall. And then uh, as last part of this table here, here are some research gaps and what needs to be addressed. But let me now uh, focus more on um, early warning systems. And let's imagine that climate change leads to, um, uh, to environmental consequences in, in society. I mentioned these climate hazards that have direct exposures like heat stroke that we mentioned a couple of weeks ago in the session that we had two, two weeks ago, or indirect exposures like vector-borne diseases or other infectious diseases, and of course, there's economic impacts. And we in public health, we tend to monitor these health outcomes at the very end of this causal chain with our surveillance systems. But would it potentially be possible that as, as opposed to monitor there at the end of this causal chain that we work upstream and that we monitor these environmental precursors of disease, these climatic precursors of disease before they occur. And that's the system that we have built at ECDC, the European Environment Epidemiology Network. And the concept was that if you have an epidemiologic curve like this one here without an early warning system, but if in fact you're able to monitor an environmental signal um, upstream and then you can set up um, active surveillance, uh, you can pick up that first case and then you can in, in, uh, uh, initiate your response activities and that should be able to repress the curve that we are so familiar with now in our post-COVID society. So this is the concept to uh, pick up an early signal, um, early epidemic precursors of disease in order to initiate response quickly. And so when we assessed the infectious diseases that are uh, linked to climate change, we grouped them into high, medium, and low on this diagram here. On the y-axis, you can see that some, 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 some pathogens are strongly associated with climate or climate change, and so what we call them climate sensitive. And then we asked ourselves, if a pathogen now is strongly linked with climate hazards, do we need to take public health action? 
And we basically decided not necessarily just because there is a link with climate doesn't need need doesn't mean that we need to do anything about it. However, if that impact from that pathogen is high, and now we, we rank it against potential severity of consequence to society with low, medium, and high, mm -hmm. then we get this weighted risk analysis where we now rank these pathogens against the link with climate and impact on society. And we get this more differentiated analysis of what needs to be done. And we basically discovered that so several of the pathogens that are strongly linked with climate change are in fact not adequately surveyed in, in Europe or not reportable by law at all. And after we had published this paper, um, um, the member states in Europe, in fact, came together and put TBE, tick-borne encephalitis, under surveillance. Lyme borreliosis has now been put on, uh, under surveil surveillance. It's actually Lyme neuroborreliosis, but that's a step in the right direction. And there's even uh, surveillance for um, um, other pathogens like dengue, at, at least on a regional scale in the southern part of, of Europe. However, there's one pathogen for which there is no continent-wide continent -wide surveillance system or, so, sorry, um, a, a reporting system, and that are these Vibrio bacteria. So Vibrio, these are not the cholera bacteria. So these are Vibrio bacteria, like Vibrio vulnificus or Parimaliticus, that um, are of concern. And we built a system where we are able to uh, link environmental data with epidemiologic data to connect these uh, dots illustrated on this diagram here, where we merged environmental epidemiologic data in order to interpret them, analyze them, and, and uh, integrate them. And the case study now is for these Vibrio infections. And here again, I show Northern Europe with the Baltic Sea. And it turns out that we have something that's called the Vibrio map viewer that monitors climatic conditions in the Baltic Sea, actually worldwide, but now it's calibrated for the Baltic. And in fact, these Vibrio bacteria, they are um, particularly sensitive to temperature. And so due to the warming trend, these Vibrio bacteria, they thrive. But guess what? When it gets warm, everybody else goes to the Baltic. And so we see a lot of people being exposed to the brackish water in the, in the Baltic. And here again, you can see uh, temperature increases in, in pink. That leads to an increase in sea surface temperature. And this is exactly then when these bacteria start uh, replicating. Um, you can see pathogen amplification, and then that can lead to exposures in human, uh, um, um, in, in, to, during recreational water use. And in this case, this one here is an estuary where you have brackish water, so water with relatively low salt content. And this is exactly what these bacteria thrive in. They want to have low salinity and the temperature above 15 degrees, and that's when they start proliferating. And there are a number of these type of, of Vibrio bacteria, like Vulnificus or Paramoliticus, and they can lead to serious wound infections, gastroenteritis, or, or, or septicemia. Um, and so we set up an early warning system where we monitor the environmental suitability uh, of sea surface temperature and salinity, and then through remote sensing and make that available through our platform. And here is the platform. This is the Vibrio map viewer, and you can see here in 2014, the Baltic was heating up, and we knew that something was going on in, in the Baltic because the, the, the environmentally, environmental conditions were so conducive. So we set up a case crossover study where we linked the climatic conditions to cases found in certain counties in Sweden where these bacteria are reportable by law. So they're not reportable on, an, on a European scale, but in, in Sweden they are. And so we basically set up um, a case crossover study to monitor the climatic conditions prior to the occurrence of that case in that particular county. And we did in fact pick up this uh, this peak in cases in 2014 that corresponded to that environmental peak that we had picked up earlier. So it was, in fact, an environmental precursor of that, that outbreak.
And so the dose response curve uh, looks quite dramatic with the relative risk increasing with increasing sea surface temperature illustrated on this graph here. And if you project that forward in time in the coming decades, we expect that to increase uh, dramatically illustrated here by different months. And you can see the warmer months and even the colder months are expected to have more conducive climatic conditions for these type of Vibrio bacteria infections um, in the future. And this in here is, uh, again, by different decades, looking uh, at the projections throughout the coast of, of, of the Baltic in, in Sweden. And it turns out that here 2018, a few years ago, we saw picked up another signal. And in fact, th these reports are now produced by ECDC on a um, weekly basis during the summer months. And um, 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 the CDTR, the Communicable Disease Threat Report, goes out to all the state epidemiologists and we tell them that here, is, for example, in the Bay of Riga, you, we are expecting these conducive conditions, so you might want to close the beach, you might want to stop people from going swimming, you might want to alert healthcare providers, you want to alert the public, make sure that people don't exposed, that don't get exposed, particularly those that have a suppressed immune system, so we can avoid these kind of fatalities because they can potentially be fatal, these infections. And in fact, here you can see this is the, the, the peak. Again, this one here is 2018, and it corresponds to this massive peak in, in cases again. So in, in summary, we are concerned about the burden from war, waterborne diseases in light of climate change um, because our um, system is not built for these extreme climate events and we need to consider mitigation and adaptation to reduce the burden of disease illustrated on the right side of this cube here. And um, we can do that through mitigation. Here you have the climate hazard on the left illustrated on the y-axis. And obviously we can reduce the energy consumption um, um, overall, but specifically for our water uh, utilities. Uh, we can establish more efficient technologies and practices, use renewable energy and energy recovery and water conservation to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions through mitigation. But then obviously we can also work on adaptation and in this case here reduce our um, um, vulnerabilities um, and um, uh, our exposure to, to these um, types of threats in order to have an impact on, on the, the disease burden. So there are a number of things we can do here by working on, with the, on the WASH system, the surveillance systems or on the regulations, but also ensure, ensure access to care, uh, improve our policies, inform, educate the public and build these community uh, relationships with stakeholders that we need to engage. So in summary, um, we need to climate prove our water treatment and distribution systems in order to prevent, prepare for, and manage climate sensitive waterborne diseases. And the thing we can do, we can build these integrated early warning systems that integrate environmental, climatic, or other types of data and link them with epidemiologic data. And we can use them as environmental or climatic precursors of disease so we can intervene early. And then reducing the water disease burden um, um, will uh, require us to provide safe and equitable access to clean water and sanitation. And the thing that we need to do, we need to go back to our to the basic public health principles. In fact, public health became famous during, due to these interventions. And we need to go back and adapt our infrastructure to this extreme um, climate hazard, extreme weather events, and improve our water infrastructure and reduce our uh, um, dependence on fossil fuels. Here are the colleagues that have contributed to um, the work. And uh, if you have any questions, here's my email and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Dr. Semen, Professor Semenza for your presentation. Very interesting presentation. Uh, we had a lot of different questions uh, in the Q&A panel. So the first of all, um, what can be best recommended to maintain sufficient and good water supply quality, sanitation and hygiene, especially in areas uh, where there is extreme temperature condition and where water resources are scarce? In. Yeah, so um, the, the thing that we documented in, in Central Asia was the fact that you cannot pump 
um, water into the water distribu distribution system that then gets cross-contaminated with sewer. So it, it requires engineering and public health interventions to make sure that the water supply is uh, adequate. For example, at the time, USAID, which is the US development agency, they wanted us to propose that we should build a water uh, a reverse osmosis plant. And that obviously that is not a solution if you have a system that cross connects with the sewer line because you can clean that, that water and it gets instantly contaminated in the distribution system. So there have to be other solutions to this kind of water scarcity and we might have to uh, um, um, re, you know re-engineer the, the pipes so they can't get contaminated and make sure that people get access to to water and maybe water home chlorination will be a situation a solution for those communities where there just isn't enough uh, water to put into the water distribution system okay Thank you. Uh, another question uh, linked with the wastewater contamination of water resources is the, the different types of, uh, of uh, wastewater collection. Uh, so does the use of uh, trench latrines or wide bore lessen the dispersion rates, especially in area where no proper sewage line is there? So it's kind of complementary of your... Yeah, yeah, no, sorry, so I, I, I fully agree. So the the... the... The sanitation system needs to be uh, uh, adapted to the the circumstances and and make make sure to keep away from potential uh, high water tables and 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 avoid this kind of cross connections. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so another one linked with um, also linked with the, what you present uh, related to the cholera in Southern Africa. So actually, we are. We are seeing a, a spike in the number of cases and deaths uh, related. Uh, uh, you, you said about uh, so the, the different practice uh, related to uh, wastewater management. Uh, but um, do, do you, can you provide some uh, information about the links with uh, the actual uh, El Nino event and the climatic events in this area? So th that is true that El Nino has been associated with these uh, cholera outbreaks. And the thing we need to be aware of is that these disproportionately impacts population that have been, uh, that are susceptible, that are naive, that haven't been exposed to cholera before, and that suddenly introduce the pathogen into a naive population, and you have conducive climatic conditions like an El Nino event with increased uh, temperature and increased precipitation, and then it can spread li li like wildfire. So we have to be very concerned about the, the circumstances um, of the, the entire um, sanitation system. So if, for example, um, uh, like in Yemen, all water treatment and sanitation systems were destroyed by Saudi Arabia during the war, then obviously that is a fertile ground for a cholera outbreak, and that's exactly what happened. So climatic conditions are one thing, but then also the, the, the societal vulnerability is the other one, and they need to be seen in concert. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have room for one or two questions more. Um, So what advice do you have on engaging the environmental experts in mitigating outbreak at community uh, level? Um, that's a great point because I have always advocated for bringing environmental scientists, um, veterinarians and epidemiologists to the table in a One Health approach to address these type of, of issues. And we tend to work in our pigeonholes where the human health experts work um, on, on the issues. Um, um, separated from the work that uh, that's being done in the environmental health department, the environmental departments, or in in the veterinary uh, domain, and we need to make sure that we build integrated systems where we can, can can connect environmental data with animal data with human data in order to make sense out of what's going on. Guess what? The world was never designed to be separated by disciplines. That's our invention, and it doesn't really do us a, a, a good a service. So we need to bridge these disciplinary divides and come together as, as a community to address these issues. And I, I very much full-heartedly endorse bringing these environmental experts to the table to help us solve the, these, these issues that can only be solved collectively. Okay, thank you. I have a last question. Um, 
So you, you talk about about um, biological contamination, but is there also specific uh, chemicals that are likely to negatively affect water quality and human health as a uh, as a result of climate change? Um, absolutely. So there are lots of issues here uh, as well, because the flooding obviously can mobilize pathogens, but uh, it can also mobilize a lot of chemicals, right? And so we know how these flood events can potentially uh, contaminate the water with with chemicals, with oil or, or other sources that are detrimental to human health. And I focus now on the infectious disease part, part, but obviously there are other aspects that need to be considered as well when it comes to these societal vulnerabilities that are triggered by an extreme climatic event. Um, and so again, we need we need to take that, make that part of the whole equation as well. I fully agree. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jan Semenza, for your uh, lecture intervention and this answer to the question. Um, so we will move on to the next presentation. Uh, so I will present now the two case studies uh, following this lecture. Uh, so the first one uh, is uh, <clears throat> the case study from uh, Dr. Ana Laura Carducci. So Dr. Analoa Carducci is a full professor of general and applied hygiene at the Department of Biology in the University of Pisa. She's graduated in biological science <clears throat> and uh, also she's responsible of the hygiene and environmental virology laboratory and of the health communication observatory. She's also a director of a uh, different master and of the different of the interdepartmental center of health promotion and information technologies of the University of Pisa. Her research main topics are about the epidemiology and prevention of infectious disease with particular focus on biological risk analysis for foods, water, hair, and life in working settings. She's interested in health and risk communication and is authored more of 250 extended publications and indexed and impact journal books, chapter, and conference proceedings. So, Dr. Analoa Carducci, I invite you to give your presentation for 10 minutes plus question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you for the possibility of, of speaking about uh, water use uh, because it is a, a possible uh, solution uh, for uh, climate change. Using water can be um, an important uh, um, <clears throat> mitigation measure. It is also mentioned by the uh, measures of, uh, by the target of the sixth uh, sustainable development and goals uh, that uh, are uh, aimed to improve water quality by reducing pollution, but also by increasing recycling and safe reuse of water. Water uh, reuse is considered as an adaptation measure to climate change, but also it has economic, social, and environmental benefits. But uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, only a small fraction of uh, water uh, is reused uh, because of barriers uh, from uh, economic, regulatory, technical, social points of view. Among these barriers, uh, uh, we consider in this presentation just the health uh, hazards uh, related to microbial hazards. They are not the only one, but uh, they are the most evident ones uh, from epidemiological and risk assessment studies. In fact, the use of, uh, of water, of reused water, can uh, uh, be drinking user, agriculture uh, user to irrigate uh, uh, food production or green spaces, industrial use for energy production, cooling uh, other processes, urban use for antifire, fountains, and so on. And in every one of these uh, reuse, uh, uh, we can find uh, uh, the, possi the possible exposure of people to microbial hazard for drinking and food uh, um, production, mainly enteric infections from uh, um, enteric uh, pathogens, as we said in the previous presentation, but also 
for um, the bioaerosol pro pro produced from the different water used, uh, the possibility of exposure to um, respiratory pathogens. Uh, for, and the, the population at risks are uh, consumer workers and uh, also population uh, living nearby uh, different plants. Um, for this reason, uh, the reuse needs uh, an important uh, regulation. The regulation, uh, the European regulation, um, is uh, in to force since uh, uh, the last June, only for irrigation purposes, and it distinguishes the uh, water quality, the reuse water quality, in four classes. Um, considering some parameters for their classification, uh, but uh, from the um, microbial point of view, the most important parameter is E. coli. Then uh, can be also considered other microbial parameters as indicators or index pathogens for, for treatments, and also uh, to establish a water safety plan for the uh, reuse uh, uh, risk management. Uh, but uh, at present, uh, the wastewater treatment plants uh, in Europe are, are almost always not ready for the reuse because uh, they are based on old uh, technologies. So uh, some questions uh, about the um, microbial risk for water use are, uh, are the treatments sufficient for the compliance to EU regulation at present? And another question, are treatment performance influenced by the weather condition? And finally, the standard indicators are sufficient to show microbial risks and to perform uh, real, real uh, risk assessment. Uh, so to answer to these questions and the other, uh, we uh, studied uh, two wastewater treatment plants in different uh, uh, areas of the northern Tuscany. The project is uh, financed by uh, the program of research and innovation in partnership with the sewerage company. We studied two uh, wastewater treatment plants um, for about the analyzing the data for of about six years, considering the uh, compliance with the um, class D of E. coli uh, concentration at the exit. We see that uh, for the plant one, almost all uh, samples were not compliant with the class D. For the plant two, uh, we, we see a clear difference um, between before and after the October uh, 2021. And the reason is that for this second plant, after the date, uh, there was a chlorination. So um, after October 21, the compliance was 93% for class D and 52% for class A. So it's simple, chlorination is important for disinfection is important. Uh, but the other question was about, about uh, the um, influence of rain on the uh, exit of E. coli. But in this case, uh, our results for the moment uh, are not uh, uh, very, very conclusive because the number of rainy days are very, very few. So uh, we can see uh, very rare heavy rains during the period, and we are speaking about six years, and the same uh, for the second plant. So the rainy days uh, during the uh, sampling uh, for uh, to assess the um, the wastewater treatment plant compliance. So uh, we can say that uh, for these uh, plants, uh, we have not conclusive data, but we know that in other studies, in other previous studies, uh, heavy rainfall uh, 
are very important to reduce the uh, efficiency of uh, uh, plants in uh, um, reducing um, microbial indicators. But uh, the other questions, probably the most important questions for uh, microbial risk assessment is uh, which kind of indicators and parameters we have to uh, monitor to understand and to evaluate risks and to plan um, management uh, measures. And we have uh, uh, analyzed for a shorter period than six years, but we analyzed the process indicator E. coli and coliphages, index pathogens, salmonella as index pathogen for bacteria, and the human adenovirus index pathogen for viruses, and some viral pathogens, enteroviruses, neuroviruses, and SARS CoV 2. They were monitored at the entrance after secondary treatment and at the exit of the plant. For bacteria, we can see that the decrease of E. coli as process indicator is quite uh, important, three, uh, more than three logs uh, generally for both uh, uh, wastewater treatment, except in wet weather conditions. The presence of salmonella at the exit was significantly associated with E. coli, non-compliance for class T. So E. coli can be considered a good a process indicator for salmonella, for example. Different is the, uh, the situation for viruses because somatic polyphages as process indicators uh, are uh, reduced about three, four logs, the same. But uh, at the exit of the plant, we always found adenovirus uh, in the first plant and in the 62% uh, of, the, of the samples for the second plant. These adenoviruses are um, monitored um, with a PCR, so genome. But we know that uh, the um, uh, amount of this genome is so high that we can uh, consider that uh, a part of this uh, positivity are from infective um, adenoviruses. So um, the process indicators E. coli and polyphages indicate a, an important reduction uh, of, um, of the two plants, but uh, uh, not uh, uh, the same for adenoviruses. And uh, uh, the other viruses monitored were present uh, in almost all samples at the entrance, in particular enterovirus and noroviruses. Their frequency were uh, re reduced after secondary treatment, 90% entero and noro um, SARS-CoV-2 disappeared. But after chlorination, 6% of samples were still contaminated by noroviruses. And as we have seen, 62% for, uh, for adenoviruses. So to conclude, uh, water use is a possible solution to climate change, but uh, um, probably it can be affected by, uh, by um, them, uh, mainly for uh, the heavy rains and uh, um, meteorological events. But uh, we have to take in consideration that uh, the representativeness of process indicator and index pathogens towards microbiological risks varies. For example, they are quite uh, representative for bacteria, not the same for viruses. So we uh, should uh, consider that the only E. coli monitoring is insufficient for a complete microbial risk assessment. Uh, so thank you for your uh, attention and uh, question. Thank you very much, Dr. Analoa uh, Carducci for this uh, very interesting talk uh, on this case study on the reuse water. Uh, so we will move on directly on to the second uh, case study, and then we'll take the question uh, after that. So 
I will uh, invite now the Dr. Um, Marija Jeftic, which is a full professor at University of Novi Sad, Faculty of Medicine in Serbia, specialist in uh, so in hygiene and uh, in <clears throat> medical ecology at the Institute of Public Health of Vojvodina, a research collaborator at the University Libre de Bruxelles, and on different other uh, center and um, academy uh, of medical sciences. She has almost 30 years of experience in the research and education process and advocacy in public health and environmental and health. Her field of interest and work is public health, one health, planetary health, <clears throat> climate change and health, disaster and health migration, mental health, school health, food safety, health management, and organizational consulting. She has published more than 160 papers in international and national journals and chapters in textbooks and monographs. So Dr. Marija Jevtic, I invite you to give the lectures for 15 minutes and we'll move on to the question after that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part uh, of this uh, global educational um, event. And uh, I will talk uh, about uh, water as uh, resource and uh, also a possible risk. Uh, as uh, you can see, uh, water plays a crucial role in various uh, biological, ecological and industrial process. And it, it is vital for human survival, also plays a crucial role in regulating uh, Earth's climate and many industrial processes rely on water. Um, of course, I would uh, uh, I, <clears throat> I will talk uh, today more about uh, water as a risk, and I will present um, uh, floods uh, as a, a risk uh, which uh, we can uh, have as a result of uh, water. Floods pose significant risk to both human communities and the environment, and also uh, it uh, can damage the homes, business, infrastructure, agricultural land, and also pose a huge economical um, consequences. Floods often uh, result in the displacement of communities and have severe consequences for the environment, land, the water pollution, destruction of um, settlements and habitats. Floods damage critical infrastructure like roads, uh, bridges, and uh, other utilities. Waterborne disease can spread lack of clean water and sanitation, and facilities can exacerbate uh, uh, health challenges. Climate change is contributing to more frequent and intense um, after the rainfalls events and uh, other extreme events. I will try to present case from Serbia, a small country in Western Balkan country, uh, West, Western Balkan area, and it is important to know some facts um, for um, um, Western Balkan. It was possible to predict extreme rainfall relatively early due to the large scale forcing uh, of the event. However, Rainfall forecasts alone cannot be used to forecast floods accurately and the complexity of the land surface and the variable response times of river catchments mean that we have to be able to model the, um, the conditions, uh, the hydrological process, but we cannot um, uh, predict uh, uh, all uh, other uh, consequences. Serbia was confronted with the worst flood disaster in 2014. Uh, I would like to show you one uh, small uh, video regarding this um, uh, uh, very terrible events. The floods in Serbia in 2014. Uh, see. Uh, sorry. Uh, the floods in Serbia in 2014 were uh, a result of heavy rainfall that affected several countries in the Balkan region during the May 2014. Uh, the rainfall caused rivers overflow, leading to widespread flooding in Serbia, but also 
Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia. The situation was uh, particularly severe in Serbia. The floods in Serbia uh, were among the worst in the country's history. Thousands of people were evacuated from their homes and numerous towns and villages were severely affected. The flooding led to a humanitarian crisis with many people losing their homes and facing postages of food, water and other essential supplies. The government, along with various organizations and neighboring countries, engaged in um, the action to uh, solve uh, all challenges. The flood waters caused significant damage to infrastructure, including roads, bridges, and buildings. International community, including neighborhood countries, WHO, and other UN uh, agency, um, assist and provided assistance and support uh, in the form of aid rescue teams and supplies. The aftermath of the floods involved extensive reconstruction, first rehabilitation of affected areas and initiatives to prevent similar disasters in the future. The disaster highlighted um, the importance of preparedness and effective response uh, to natural disasters. The concentration of disaster effect generated a ne negative bearing on economic growth uh, with a corresponding impact of life goods, income, uh, the environment, plus a significant decline in living conditions of the population. The high de de destruction that occurred in the mining sector uh, demanded the search for alternative source of energy and electricity. Damages to education facilities were not extensive, and the disaster occurred at um, the end of the school year, so that the disruption in the education sector didn't die. But in the health sector, partial destruction uh, of a number of clinics and healthcare facility, uh, facilities, together with the damages to medical equipment and supplies. The Human Development Index in Serbia sustained a decline in 2014 because of the creation of income decline and uh, of access with, uh, to education and health services in about two years. Furthermore, it has been estimated that the disaster has lead more than 125,000 persons to fall below the poverty line and uh, increase the nearly 7% over previous year number of people living under poverty conditions. So after the Serbia floods in 2014, um, we organized post-disaster risk um, uh, needs assessment, and uh, I have I had an opportunity to be a, a part of the team to provide the information for um, uh, healthcare facilities, uh, and that is interesting that we also uh, provide uh, um, provided information about um, uh, damages of cultural heritage. This is the first time that. Uh, UN agency organized um, uh, assessment regarding cultural heritage. So uh, this is uh, th this was a very useful experience, not only for Serbia and Western Balkan, but also for uh, another future disaster and uh, negative uh, events. So, um, in addition to the negative direct effects of the floods and landslides over the population, the disaster brought about additional problems related to living and uh, environmental conditions. Uh, floods waters uh, uh, and rising groundwater level covered some industrial zones and threatened to release hazardous waste with potential negative impact on health conditions of the population. Mine disposal sites were also flooded uh, and the waste material was uh, discharged into rivers, 
that were used of sources of, of the drinking water supplies. Fortunately, these threats to health didn't materialize and indicated by chemical analysis on the water uh, sources. As a result of the disaster, a total 1 million and 600,000 uh, persons were directly or indirectly affected in the country. Um, most people uh, which uh, were affected uh, moved uh, into relatives' homes, but about 5,000 uh, were placed into temporary shelter camps organized by, by Red Cross and the government. These facts resulted in doubling the number of internally displaced persons in the country that prevailed before disaster occurred. We can see the estimated values of damages and losses uh, per uh, sector, where may be observed that the mining and energy sectors sustained the highest values of uh, disaster, followed by housing, agriculture, and trade. Effects of, uh, on infrastructure and physical assets are uh, very large. Out of uh, 24 municipalities declared by the government to be most seriously affected by flooding, 15 reported to the Ministry of Health and National Institute of Public Health, and one more alone um, engaged by uh, some um, information about uh, damage. Many also reported loss of assets such as equipment, furniture, and medicines and supplies. The type of health facilities worst affected were healthcare facilities in the primary health care. As a result of the flooding, more than 30,000 people were evacuated from their homes, while the uh, majority of um, people found shelter with relatives, some of them uh, accommodated in temporary shelters and debris from the floods affected health facilities comprises mainly of internal furnishings such as carpets, uh, chairs, etc. equipment. In only one case, there is a need for demolition and damaged building, which will result in brick of concrete in min uh, minor quantities. Uh, coordination of activities on collecting, analyzing, and reporting data, data in healthcare sector, in public health, uh, wider in all organization regarding drinking water quality, water supply situation, epidemiological situation, and surveillance and of collective centers uh, were um, uh, very well organized, uh, but very complex and um, um, these organizations uh, lead um, uh, healthcare professionals in a burnout. When we talk about uh, consequences, we should mention mental health. It is um, too soon to assess the impact on mental health, but is, it is highly expected an increase in stress-related behavior such as smoking, alcohol, drinking, and maybe domestic violence. Uh, in Belgrade, the, the Mental Health Institute organized mobile teams to visit collective centers in the city to provide counseling and support to help, to help mitigate uh, and risky behavior among individuals, but also help uh, and give support uh, to people with um, anxiety, hopelessness, uh, depression, etc. A total of 74 health and health related facilities were damaged uh, in 16 municipalities. The value of the damages of municipalities is more than 1.75 million euros. The main disaster risks in the water supply and wastewater disposal sector um, linked to damages in infrastructure and interruption to supplies, negative impacts of water quality, uh, such as additional treatment or imported drinking water are required, and uh, of course, insufficient water 
uh, due to drought and emergencies uh, and supply problems. The estimated value of recovery needs uh, for health uh, care sector amount, um, amounts to more than 2.6 million euros and includes uh, the following activities, temporary cost of transport of dial uh, dialysis pa patient for treatment in Belgrade until the destroyed hospital is reconstructed, the cost of providing mental counseling over six months to persons affected by disaster, the increase of costs of epidemiological and hygiene surveillance, the cost of vaccination and other prevention measures, especially for Roma children under five years uh, of age, the urgent replacement of destroyed medicine and medicine supplies, the cost of public information campaigns to reduce risk of disaster-induced uh, disease and the cost of laboratory uh, analysis of food risk. Um, it's also important to know, uh, note that that is a, a very important uh, prevention of ve vector control uh, disease. As a lesson learned uh, after the post-disaster uh, needs assessment and um, uh, when we saw uh, the amount of money and uh, economic uh, loss, uh, we uh, recognized that Serbia should consider adopting the co a comprehensive tracking system to monitor uh, the flow of all public uh, spending in response to the disaster, including source of uh, relating funding. Systematic tracking systems are essential in order to effectively manage disaster response efforts, identify gaps uh, in funding, support accountability, and draw lessons learned for potential improvements in disaster uh, risk financing arrangements. Also, the main achievements is uh, in, important to mention that the, during the and after month, uh, month of floods, uh, no outbreak uh, was occurred in affected areas, and that is very um, important and excellent results. Uh, Serbia should ensure that the governance models uh, for recovery that establish roles and responsibilities for all actors include mechanisms to hold all stakeholders accountable. The government should use the recovery plan and planning process to align all factors behind uh, its risk uh, reduction agenda. And this is an uh, example importance that held in all politics, especially in urban planning, preparedness for emergencies and governance. And for the end, uh, I will. Uh, I uh, put uh, at the slide the citate of our very famous writer and uh, philosopher, uh, uh, which describe our behavior to nature and the environment, which we would uh, should uh, change as a uh, um, humans, because uh, health it's not the privilege only for us. It is important to uh, achieve health of environment and the planet as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marija, for your presentation. So we'll now move on on question for the two uh, case studies. Um, so for the Dr. Anavala Carducci, uh, first of all, we have a question about uh, would separating gray sewage from brown sewage uh, could improve the reuse of uh, water? That's, uh, that's the first question. Uh, yes, of course. If you uh, can uh, um, treat uh, uh, gray sewages, that means that uh, you have uh, a, an original uh, sewage less polluted than the brown uh, uh, water. So it's better for the final results, of course. The problem is that even a gray um, sewage sometimes are contaminated by brown. It's uh, difficult sometimes to have the separation of the two, but uh, yes. Okay, uh, thank you. 
Um, so you, you you present the the actual regulation uh, related to wastewater reuse in Europe. So it's only for irrigation uh, uh, for now. But uh, for example, in France, we just uh, started a new regulation that opened a new uh, new area of uh, of a reuse of water, such as uh, um, <clears throat> such as for example to evacuate uh, brown water, for example. Uh, for for the green waters, uh, or to to fountains, uh, or to lead to to wash the, the the external surfaces, uh, also to for the for the green spaces uh, irrigation. So, what do you think about the potential risk associated with this uh, this uh, new kind of uses that uh, will probably uh, increase also in Europe? So uh, the. The new uh, reuse uh, or the other more traditional reuse uh, ways uh, mm, can expose people to um, different kind of, uh, uh, of of microbial risks. But the most important are the um, the ingestion risks for consumes consumption of uh, of something food or water or bioaerosol. I think that bioaerosol should be taken in big consideration in, in every kind of water use uh, for enteric pathogens, but also for Legionella. I did not speak about Legionella, but it is also another important uh, pathogen that can remain or develop in, in uh, reused water. So it can be also another possible um, hazard. Mm, okay, so we have to be extremely uh, aware of this kind of risk when we, we enlarge the use of, uh, especially in domestic situations. Yes. Thanks. So Dr. Marija, uh, I, have a, I have a question also, so I will move on because we run out of time actually. Um, so in your opinion, uh, related to these floods in Serbia, what was the most important public health lessons learned from this situation? <clears throat> so thank you for the for your question. I think that uh, this is a very good example uh, after uh, um, this event, uh, we can uh, learn a lot and uh, really we have an argument that uh, public health is very important uh, uh, for communities and uh, action plans regarding pl um, public health and I would like to conclude that we need more and more public health professionals in our communities in our cities because we can expect it more and more disaster situation and extreme situation and we uh, have to link as a health public health professionals with governance and uh, city councils to organize a preparedness plan as um, uh, possible better that we can because um, uh, the um, amount of um, sadness and the amount uh, of uh, lostness and um, uh, health, mental health consequences are uh, very huge. So education is well, education and urban planning is very important. Okay. Thank you. That will be the the, the end uh, of this uh, session. And uh, thank, I want to thank you all the presenter today, uh, Dr. Jan Semenza, Dr. Analova Carducci, and Dr. Marija Jastic for giving this presentation. I want to thank also the audience uh, for being there today and the organizer of this uh, of this uh, session and this uh, European Responder course. So I invite you to to be there next week for the for the next session and I I wish you uh, an excellent uh, day and um, see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.